Hello friends, welcome back to another session of uh, USMLE tutorials. Today I'm going to be talking about G6PD, um, some of the genetics and some of the biochemistry that are associated with G6PD. Okay, so let's talk about the pentose pathway first because that's where the whole G6PD problem comes in. So here we have glucose and glucose um, the first thing that happens with glucose is glycolysis, okay? So it's going to go into glycolysis. When we have enough glucose for glycolysis, um, we can use those glucose to make glycogen. When we have enough glycogen to last us for a certain amount of time, that's when the pentose pathway is going to kick in, kick in because those are more important for, um, for an acute, uh, acute problem rather than long term. So you know that's imp this aspect of understanding is important that this can only happen if the person is well fed so if the person is starving we're not going to have a lot of pentose pathway going on if we have a diabetic patient whose sugar is not well controlled we're not going to have this pathway so all those things are important to kind of keep in mind uh, when we're talking about pentose pathway okay so let's talk about the real uh, pathway the the pathway itself so when I learned the pathway, I kind of learned it like this, like in this format, glucose 6-phosphate forming 6-phosphate gluconate. And I had a question where they had this diagram, but not the whole diagram. They only had this part. And I kind of freaked out and they're like, what's the enzyme here? Or what's the enzyme here? Something like that. And I, I kind of started freaking out because even though I knew the pathway so well, just the orientation of the diagram kind of threw me off. So that's why I decided to kind of show my, uh, show, show my friends, you guys, that you know this could be a potential problem, and and that one minute that we have to do all these things, the questions and the, all the thinking, it can be a little overwhelming. So let's just quickly go through the pathway in this direction. So we have glucose. Glucose is forming glucose six phosphate, and the enzyme is six uh, hexokinase. Hexokinase is everywhere else, and glucokinase is in the liver. Now glucose 6-phosphate is forming 6-phosphogluconate and the enzyme has, and, and the enzyme that takes place here is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Why is this enzyme called dehydrogenase? Can you tell me? The enzyme is called dehydrogenase is become, because we are removing one hydrogen from here, from, from this glucose 6-phosphate, and this hydrogen is coming here. Okay, so that's why it's called dehydrogenase. We're removing one hydrogen, okay? And use this technique everywhere you see an equation, you know? Come up with your own enzyme and see. Okay, does that make sense? Do I really have to memorize or I can just derive it? It just gives you an extra power um, of understanding. So this pathway, when we are making NADPH, um, NADPH is the reduced form. So when this is becoming reduced, this is becoming oxidized because these are the redox reactions. Glutathione is becoming oxidized. This oxidized form of glutathione is grabbing any oxidants that we have in our RBC and becoming reduced here. That reduction is making more NADP and that NADP is making more NADP. So this is a very good cycle in our body that goes on. And this cycle happens exactly twice from glucose 6-phosphate to 6-phosphogluconate, from 6-phosphogluconate to whatever. We really don't have to know this step and this step. It's unnecessary. Kind of the one step we have to remember is this one. And we have to be aware that from glucose 6, from 6-phosphogluconate, we're going to have ribose 5-phosphate, okay? And we're going to have another cycle of this glutathione thing going on. So that is important to remember, okay? All right, so that is um, G6PD uh, pathway. One more thing I would like to mention is that what is the allosteric inhibitor or allosteric uh, acceptor of this pathway, of G6PD? The allosteric inhibitor would be uh, ribose 5-phosphate and allosteric uh, activator would be glucose 6-phosphate, okay? So these questions always come in USMLE, so I just wanted to throw that in there. So now let's talk, let's see the other type of equation where the way I learned it. Here also we have, you know, here is our um, ox uh, reduced glutathione becoming oxidized glutathione right here because 
this is the uh, this is the mm, uh, oxidized form and this is the reduced form um, of the pathway so just kind of uh, orient yourself with this diagram to see you know okay yeah I'm going to be able to uh, work with this equation either way either diagram they give us because all these arrows going in all the different directions can be a little confusing all right so now that we have that done uh, I would also like to say that um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase or G6PD um, it is uh, the rate limiting enzyme of this of the pentose pathway and whenever we have a rate limiting enzyme what kind of curve do we have or what kind of graph can we draw? It's going to be sigmoidal. Okay, it's going to be sigmoidal curve, which kind of looks like that. Okay, so don't get confused. You know, with the shape of the curve. You know, you have to see that. Yeah, it can be sigmoidal right here. So I just wanted to throw that out there to see how one problem or one uh, area or one specific example kind of branch to so many different kind of questions so that's that's the thing that I wanted to talk about in this diagram or this uh, tutorial okay so let so that's that the next thing is the genetics part of it okay so let's talk about that for a little bit now um, recently G6PD deficiency before it was X-linked recessive and recently it has been um, said that it is not actually recessive it's actually dominant okay g6pd is a is an x-linked dominant disease oh, and what are some other examples of x-linked dominant disease i have it right here so there is a couple that's often tested like duchenne's hemophilia hypophosphatemic rickets it's also called sodium resistant rickets g6pd and pseudohypoparathyroidism. These are five examples. If you can think of more, please leave me a comment below under the under the video, and I will add it when I review this video again in the future. Anyway, so these are some of the X-linked um, recessive, uh, sorry, X-linked dominant disorders, along with G6PD. Now I will talk about the the pedigree tree because that is another point where it can get, get a little confusing when we have X-linked dominant disease. I always make mistakes with these questions but they're so easy that I thought you know I'm gonna sit down and do it and here I am talking to you about this. So the, the first clue of an X-linked dominant disease is that in the first first um, first pedigree the first the first generation you're gonna have the male in black so that would be your first clue you know um, that's where they're going towards an X-linked dominant disease and when you have a black male is giving you all the girls you know all the girls all the female from the father is going to be affected that's an X-linked dominant okay and you kind of follow that trend to see let me see so we don't have any other male here you have only one daughter and the daughter is affected and why is that because um, the daughter is passing X-linked dominant so they are sorry about that uh, they are gonna have the disease and they're passing their defective X chromosome to their daughters because there's two X's one X coming from the healthy mom which is fine but the other X is coming from the dad and that X is dominantly defective so that's why all the girls is gonna have the disease but the thing is, even the guys, even the boys can have the disease too, but not necessarily depending on if they're getting um, the, the defective or the, or the dominant X or the recessive X. But all the female is going to be affected. So that is the biggest clue in determining whether this is an X-linked dominant disease. So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, let me think if, I, if there is anything else. Um, yeah, and other things, other little things about G6PD is Heinz bodies on peripheral smear, um, and, and that, you know, everyone knows about those things. Uh, also, oh, yes, one more thing is, in G6PD, um, there are certain drugs that are often, uh, cause this, uh, this, this deficiency or, this attacks of G6PD deficiency and some of the drugs are 
um, anti-malarial drugs. And then there is the sulfur drugs. Okay. Um, then there is there is the metronidazole and INH. Okay. So these are some of the drugs. But if they ask you that, um, what's so? Let's say you have a question where they give a bunch of drugs, and they give infection. And they give well, you know, starvation state. You have all these things which are possible answers of G6PD. And the question says, what's the number one reason for having G6PD attacks? What is going to be your um, response? It's going to be infection. Okay, so the number one cause is infection of having an attack if they have all these options. If they don't, then, you know, anything is whatever matches. So this is G6PD attacks. G6PD. It, number one cause is Okay, so you have all those questions, all, you know, these kind of questions all the time where they talk about you know, what's the number one reason, you know, and that always get confusing for people who even know the topics really well. So that's also very, very important to remember. Anyways, I, I think I talked a lot more than I, than I wanted to. Um, these notes is going to be on my blog, so if you need them, I know they're not very, very detailed, but sometimes, you know, a flow chart kind of situation helps a lot more to kind of put everything together. So they're going to be on my blog if you need them. If you have any comment, good or bad, please leave me a comment. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye. And oh, today's Christmas. So Merry Christmas. Bye for now.